Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. I think maybe our clock is a wee bit uh, slow. So, I'm um, sorry. Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes slow. Anyway, sorry about that. So welcome to those in the building. Welcome to those on Zoom. Um, a special welcome to Graham Clark, who's leading worship this morning. We're very grateful to Graham. He seems already very much part of the family here in Cathcart. Um, you know, we have a, our close links with the, the three churches and it's just one faith community and we're really delighted that Graham has come to a part of that through Cathcart Baptist Church and has made himself available for preaching for which we're extremely grateful so thank you once again Graham for spending time with us this morning and we're delighted that your wife Christine's able to be here this morning hope the folk will take a chance to get to know Christine as well and um, so welcome one and all um, evening service tonight at Trinity Church. It'll be the second in the Sleeping Giant series, but more of that in a minute. So 6.30 tonight if you're free at Trinity. And then just a reminder of our usual prayer time on Zoom on Monday, 8 till 9, where we pray for um, our congregation, our the way forward, and anyone else that needs prayer or asks for prayer. We are happy to bring them to the Lord in prayer. And we're very happy if anybody else would like to join us at that. Tom can give you the coordinates. We're sorry it is on Zoom, so if you're not um, on Zoom, uh, you know, if that's a problem, please let me know. We'd like to know that, uh, but it, it works for the people who come at the moment. So, but if that's a problem to you, let me know um, and we'll have a talk about that. Now, you should have got something in your hand this morning. Did you all get a Radiate um, newsletter? Um, I don't know about you, but last week when Cara was sharing all the work of Radiate, I was exhausted just hearing what they were doing. <laughs> How they actually do it all, I don't know. But if you didn't quite take it all in, it's all in this leaflet, tells you all that's happening. Um, Andrew's asked me to mention, particularly there's a fundraising brunch on Saturday the 18th of February. So get that in your diary now and go along. It's at the Baptist Church, 11 to 1. Who doesn't love a brunch? Saturday, first of 18th of February, sorry. Um, so that's just a wee bit of advance warning. Um, but also, as, as Cara mentioned last week, um, CAIO, which is their group for young, well, those in upper secondary and young adults up to their 20s, they meet for a Bible study, but they're doing a book study at the moment. And the book that they're studying is The Sleeping Giant. I think Cara did mention this last week. And we are encouraging everyone in the local faith community to read this book because we feel that it's a really important book. Now, I can tell you, it is um, Martin Fair, who was a past moderator of the Church of Scotland, he commented on it as this in this way he said from start to finish this book is both a wake-up call to the church and a wonderful encouragement that god is not finished with scotland <laughs> tommy calls us to renewal and revival and reformation but all the time reminds us that such movements are god's doing even so as pages are turned we find ourselves inspired to join in to shout count me in lord and beyond that, we're inspired to pray and to persevere in prayer and to recognise it as the priority. If that touches you at all, I'd really encourage you to get into a group. So a, a very good one to go to would be um, the one at the Baptist Church. So it's eight till nine, starting this Tuesday. And then it is um, fortnightly, I think. Yes, fortnightly. But the details are all in your wee leaflet. So please, and that'll be a fun. And it'd be good to study with young people. You know what I mean? Di bring different perspectives. Um, those still at school, those studying, young adults, and the rest of us. Um, so that's that. It, it so happens um, there are other groups. So if you can't manage on a Tuesday and would like to go to a Sleeping Giant book, please let me know. We'll try and find you one. Um, un well, not unfortunately, but Sheila and I host one already that's in our house. So. If you've wanted something smaller or on Zoom, then certainly you're, you're very welcome to join ours. But it's at the same time as the CAIO one. So that's the one that really um, we'd encourage you to go to. OK, if you get any questions about any of that, it makes no sense at all. Just ask, just ask me afterwards. OK, um, back to this week's activities on Wednesday with our usual reflective service on Wednesday morning, 1030 in here. Um, and you're very, very welcome to come, whether you're a regular or not. Um, bring friends, neighbours, whatever, for a quiet reflective service in the middle of the week. Then on Thursday, as usual, renew well-being at the Baptist Church from 10 till 12. Again, a safe space. Um, particularly if you're finding life a struggle, but not necessarily, just to go along and meet with other people. There are rhythms of prayer throughout the morning, if you want to take part in that. There are things to do, people to talk to, and coffee to be drunk. So 10 to 12 in the Baptist Church every Thursday. Um, 
just also an invitation you know we have the open doors prayer support group this is for the persecuted church and the next meeting is on wednesday the 31st of january so that's a week on wednesday and that's in the buchanan hall at trinity across the road so it's an opportunity there to find out a bit more about the lives and circumstances of some of our persecuted brothers and sisters throughout the world and then to pray into their situations sometimes we write letters that's not mentioned so maybe it's not letter writing this time but you know if you know sometimes you, you just there are terrible stories of the the suffering that people have simply because they own the name of christ in our world so you know we we should be um supporting them in prayer and if you can go on the wednesday night to do so i'm sure you'd find that interesting and encouraging so it's wednesday the 31st now next sunday catherine's going to be taking part in the service and giving a, a bit of an update as you know she's home on a uh, home assignment they call it nowadays don't they um so um she'll be telling us a bit more about the work that's going on in spain amongst the muslim women that are the muslim community um and just generally where she is at the moment and what she'll be doing so that's next sunday look forward to that and then in two weeks' time, we've got the moderator of the United Free Church coming, the Reverend Archie Ford. I know quite a lot of us know Archie, but some maybe don't. Um, he's recently retired as the Minister of Loch Winnock, United Free Church, after a long ministry. And um, yeah, it'll be lovely to welcome uh, Archie. I don't think we stand up anymore and shout moderator and all that stuff. It's much, much less formal than it, I remember when I was a child, we were all terrified of this man in a big flowing cape with fringes on it no it's this no it's nothing like that at all but he is the moderator of the Free church and he comes around different congregations and we've been chosen for a visit this year so that'll be lovely i think he did he choose us john were we a special choice no were we just on the list he chooses where he comes and he's chosen us so let's turn up and be there <laughs> shouldn't ask you that in public john right there we go um so, um, oh, just a week, a card from Sandra. Now, Sandra is the nearest person to a relative that Matthew Johnston had. There was no blood relationship, but his brother's wife's niece, who lives in Vancouver, was the nearest thing to a relative he had. She was very attentive to, to um, Matthew all through COVID. She was on Zoom. She was on the phone to him. And she linked in on Zoom to his funeral service. And she's written a lovely card just saying how much she appreciated being part of that service, how happy she was that it reflected just the person that Matthew was. And she said that next time she's in Scotland, she's definitely coming to church to meet us all. So there we go. So that's her. If you want to see the card, you can let me know. Now, Andrea is going to come and say a few words, and then John's going to say a few words. And if there's any time left, Graham, you can take the surface on. Okay. <laughs> I've just nearly knocked over the podium, but anyway. Um, okay, this is about prayer. Another opportunity to pray on Saturday. It's a lunch, so you'll get soup, and then we're going to have a time of prayer together. Now, why are we doing this? Well, partly because Leslie's talking about on a Monday, it's on Zoom. So this is in person. It's your chance to come and pray. If you're bored about the church, if you're bored about yourself, bored about other people, come and pray because early in the, the, the church's history, people met regularly to pray together. There's nothing scary. There's nothing mysterious about it. You can come. You can sit, be part of the group. You can pray to yourself silently, not to yourself, but to God <laughs> inwardly. Um, or you can pray out loud. It's very informal. We're going to start off by thinking about what we can thank God for, and then we're going to move on to what we can ask God for. So pretty simple. It will start at half 12, lunch between half 12 and 1, and it will be finished by 2, mainly because I need to leave. So it will be finished by 2, okay? So please, please think of it seriously coming. As a church, we need to get used to praying together. Anything that we do in the church should be built on prayer. So here ended the lesson. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Thank you for that. Um, can, can I just check, is, is Adrian with us on Zoom, Leeming? Yes, good morning, Adrian. It's good to, well, it's good to have you with us. I can't actually see you. Um, and ask that question because I, I just want to say a word um, about Adrian. We had a, a letter on Friday giving us official information um, that actually on, on medical advice, Adrian is retiring as General Secretary, and that's taking effect from Tuesday of this week. So we wanted the congregation to know that. And Adrian, our thoughts are with you. Uh, we are very grateful to you for the work you have done as General Secretary. And we hope that after Tuesday, you can chill a bit and no doubt God will find other things for you to do. 
But can I just take a moment to pray for Adrian? Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for Adrian and for all that he means to us as a congregation. And we thank you for the many ways in which he has served you over the years in Nepal and in this country. And thank you particularly for his time as General Secretary. And we pray that you will be with him, Father, uh, as he retires and just in all the, the mixed emotions that that will no doubt bring. But we do pray that this will give him an opportunity to relax and to be refreshed. May he know your presence. May he know your peace. May your love surround him. So bless Adrian and bless those who will be continuing the work in the office. May your hand be upon them too. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Graham. Eventually. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, it's good to see you this morning. Welcome to you's, you who are here and those who are on Zoom. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, as we come to worship you this morning, expand our vision that it may be wide enough to recognize the beautiful complexity of the tapestry you choose to weave with each and every one of us. Gather our frayed edges, our loose ends, and bind us together in worship for your glory. Amen. We stand and sing together, come, now is the time to worship. pray together again. Our gracious Heavenly Father and our God, we praise you for this place of worship, for it is the touching place of God. In Christ we are gathered from the edges and are woven into worship of you. Here we feel the hint of heaven where justice, love, and mercy meet. Here we celebrate the blessedness of unity in God. We, who were once far off, are brought near. And so we pray, God, creator of all, who in love has made each one of us, in your grace, gather us together in your image. In your mercy, make us restless until we find our rest in you. Disturb us in our contentment, distract us from our comforts, 
deter us from our conflicts. And so bless us every day until your kingdom come and your will is done. Amen. Now, Adrian is going to read to us the scripture, I believe, from Zoom. So um, we, we look forward to hearing Adrian read from Luke chapter 3, verse 21, following. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love with you, I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jedi, the son of Joseph. And I'm going to skip 60 generations <laughs> till we get to the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. A voice came from heaven, but not from Zoom. One of my friends was gifted eight family trees. We turn me down a bit. Um, thank you. That's good. And so both Christine and I had our family trees researched. My family tree was filled with tradesmen, coal miners, and farmers. My grandfather was called Peter Clark, but his father was called William Clark, which is the name of my father. And then I discovered there were a whole lot of other William Clarks that preceded that. But Christine's family tree was a bit more interesting. Her hunters which filled it with a sense of adventure coming down. However, we have still to ascertain just exactly what the treasure hunters were or who they were, and if they've ever found treasure, we don't know. Um, certainly none, none of it came our way. Later this morning, I want to look with you at the short account of the baptism of Jesus. But I begin this morning by reflecting on the sequel of Jesus' family tree. The family tree here does not conform to the usual pattern, as this one goes backwards, probably as a way of bridging the baptism where God declares Jesus son of God, and the temptation where the devil says, if you are the son of God. All three accounts, the baptism, the family tree, and the temptation, demonstrate in different ways how Jesus is son of God, and how Jesus is an example to you and to I. Of course, given that this is part of the virgin birth narrative that fronts Luke's gospel, it's not in any sense a family tree like Christine's and mine. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. What we have here is a schema, a construct of Luke, written for a theological purpose rather than the purpose that our more modern minds might be inclined to suspect. Jesus' family tree includes some heroic and admirable figures like Noah and Abraham. But most persons whose names are, are here are not in the Bible, and we don't know anything about them. Luke's genealogy, for example, traces Jesus' line through David's son Nathan, an unknown, rather than through Solomon and the rest of the Davidic kings. Such a collection fits well with the gospel itself where surprising heroes emerge. Shepherds, we don't know their names. A Samaritan, a wealthy tax collector, a loose-haired woman with a jar of perfume, and an unscrupulous business manager. I love the way that Luke weaves the lives of ordinary folks into the Jesus story. As I reflected on this, I was reminded of Nan. Nan was a wee Glasgow woman who sat at the back of the church where I went when I was younger. And in the main, Nan would go unnoticed. One day, two Canadian women came to the church early in the morning. They didn't know what time the service was. 
Nan, who was always early to get her back seat, was one of the few people there. And although she never said too much, went and got the two ladies a cup of tea and some biscuits to welcome them as they waited. In later years, as the church was facing some real financial challenges, as churches do from time to time, um, a check came from the two ladies in Canada who kept in touch and got the church newsletter every month sent to them, and they sent a check. Some years later, there was another challenge, and another check came, a much larger check. And I just thought how wonderful it was that Nan had greeted these women. She was quiet. Nobody would have noticed her. She wasn't one of the standout people in the church. She wasn't a person who was up the front. She was at the back. But God uses everyone as part of his kingdom. Those who are up the front and those who are hiding at the back. Some have asked whether Luke gives Mary's family tree here, but it's not that. Mary's not mentioned. It's just a list of people who we don't know. If you count Joseph as uh, name one, where we started, there are 77 names um, before you get to the end. There are 21 names before Abraham, 14 from Abraham to Jesse, 21 from David to Neri, and 21 from Sheila, Shealtiel to Joseph. This is a structure, a pattern which Luke gives us a shape of the family tree, 77 generations from creation to saviour between Adam and Jesus. And we're encouraged to take it in this vein as part of Luke's argument that Jesus is the culmination of God's plan to save the world. That's what he wants to say to us. He wants to save the world, and we're all involved in that. We'll get to part two in a minute. We're going to sing, Oh God, You Search Me. brave of you to ask a Baptist minister to preach on the baptism of Jesus in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> but it is Christian Unity Week, and Wilma is preaching um, in Cathcart today, and I'm here. So thank you for that trust. I hope I'll be worthy of it. Baptism is practiced in so different ways among different denominations, whether it be of infants or adults, by sprinkling, by dunking, or by pouring, or by immersion. 
Here we see how Luke's version of Jesus' baptism allows for a wide latitude in our different understanding, since the mode is only implied and not actually recounted. Critical to all of us, however, whatever our denomination, is that it depicts a baptism as a congregational event and one that is blessed by the presence of the Spirit. Wherever we are and whatever our de denomination, our baptismal services will be more Lucan, more biblical to the degree that they involve everybody in the congregation in prayer and that it enhances our understanding of the Spirit's role in incorporating the baptized into the body of Christ. At the time Luke is writing, there is ongoing Christian discomfort with the notion that John, who was God's prophet, John the Baptist, but who never became Jesus' disciple, baptized the Son of God as if Jesus was just like another sinner. Some ancients dealt with their discomfort by making the baptism a miracle, or John a Christian. But others like Luke and many modern Baptists by treating John's baptism of Jesus obliquely. The specifics of Jesus' baptism are left to our imagination in verse 21, because John is in prison in verse 20, and because when Jesus also had been baptized, is in the passive voice, so it puts it back a little. Luke seems to raise the possibility that someone other than John baptized Jesus, but that just wouldn't really make much sense um, if that was the case. For three chapters, Luke has been putting John the Baptist on a sort of parallel track with Jesus, announcing the, the birth, birth accompanied by signs and early ministry. The audience is prepared to see the Baptist immerse Jesus and then to see Jesus inaugurate the ministry of John. And this was um, who predicted Jesus as the coming one. So it'd be more than passingly strange to remove John from the role uh, of baptizing Jesus. Part of the explanation for this puzzling um, uh, verse in 21 is that in Luke's day, disciples of John the Baptist still existed as a movement separate from Christianity. As Acts 19, 1-7 tells us the story of 12 disciples, Luke does not specify whose disciples they are until the end of the story, whom Paul discovers in Ephesus. They had been baptized by John, but never heard of Jesus or of the Spirit. Paul explained things to them, baptized them in Jesus' name, and they received the Spirit and prophesied. This, it seems, is how Luke would prefer things, with the former disciples of John being absorbed into the Christian movement. Their continued separate status may have been an embarrassment, and they may have been competitors to the early church. Clearly, Luke removes John's name, an active participation from Jesus' baptism in order to make the story less about Jesus submitting to John and more about God affirming Jesus. So the focus for Luke is on God, and he wants us to see that it's God who is there in our baptism because the, Luke is trying to make Jesus' baptism a model for our baptism, and he wants us to see that in our baptism, we need God, we need God's Holy Spirit to be there. Another reason may be that Luke wants to emphasize how Jesus um, is that example for us. There comes this voice, a voice of God, you are my son. Mark has it that it's a sort of private revelation to Jesus. But here, um, the dove, we don't know why a dove became a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We, it just um, is the case. Um, there's no um, way that we can get back to, to understand where, where that came from. But the dove comes as um, a symbol of God's Holy Spirit. And that's visible. And so we don't know if the voice is heard um, along with that. But the voice comes from God, you are my son, in whom I am well pleased. Luke does not often use the title son of God for Jesus. It's here at the baptism. It's there in the temptation when Satan says, are you really the son of God, are you? 
is there in the high priest when the high priest interrogates Jesus before his crucifixion. But most of the instances when Jesus is called Son of God comes from the lips of hostile characters. But here at the baptism from the mouth of God, you are my son. It's God's public acknowledgement of Jesus, God's testimony. This is my son. And it fits well with Jesus' testimony in the temple. I must be about my father's affairs. The language is familiar. It's about family, father and son. Extended into Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, all who are here at the baptism. The relationality of the Father, Son, and Spirit is at the heart of the baptism, and it's at the heart of our Christian faith. We call it Trinity. It's defined here as a relationship of love. Here is my Son, whom I love. I love. Our Christian faith is at heart about relationships. I um, worked a little with a man called Michael Sluter, who formed a, a relationship foundation. Michael Sluter was from South Africa, but he came and did a study of the health board here in the UK, National Health Board, and talked about the failure of relationality between um, consultants and doctors and nurses and how that had to be improved. But he also looked at churches and said that relationship should be at the heart of what we do in a church. God is relational, he said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we see in Scripture how sin broke relationships. Relationship with God, and therefore with each other. It didn't take long for murder to happen, the ultimate breach in relationship to come on the scene. The three key events in history, the birth, the death, and resurrection of Jesus, were planned by God in order to bring us into relationship with God. It's in Jesus that we come into relationship with God. And then, out of that relationship with God, we come into relationship with each other. So why then do we find relationships, even relationships in the church, so difficult? Part of the answer must be that sin still affects our relationships. However, there's another reason. We've become distracted from seeing relationship as central to our life and faith. The relational understanding of Jesus' baptism in You Are My Son, I believe, calls us to look at every area of our church life with a relational point of view. As part of our thinking, it's important for us to consider some of the factors which make it easier for us to, to be together as God's people. Like, how good is our communication between each other? How direct is it? Do some people know, or does everybody know? Who's in on the grapevine? How often and how long are we with each other in our church life? I was pleased there's a lot of program in this church, a lot of things happening where people are together, and that's really important. It's that togetherness which builds us as God's people. Do we meet in different contexts and different roles? Well, we do here, and that's good. Spending time with someone from church in another con context, whether we go shopping with people or share a meal together, which is really good, um, whether we help an elderly, elderly person to get their garden done. All these things help us to grow in closeness. Do we respect each other? Do we speak well of each other? And do we share the same goals, the same vision, the same heart as God's people? For me, it seems that relationship Relationship to God and relationship to each other is at the very heart of what it is for us to be church. And in God, we see that relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit. It's in that Trinity relationship. And it calls us into relationship with each other. And our challenge is to do it better. Now, there's so much more I could have said about this passage. 
there are different readings of the text. Verse 21 has different readings. Further emphasis could be made on the eternal nature of Jesus as the Son of God. He is part of uh, the divine trinity. God from eternity to eternity. I could have spoken about that. But it seems to me I could have also spoken about the relationship of um, to the suffering servant, which it also has with you. I'm well pleased it's um, in there in Isaiah 42.1. But it seems to me that at the very heart of this understanding of baptism is that God calls us into relationship with each other. And that relationship needs to be at the core of our thinking when we're trying to think, what do we do as a church? How do we, how do we go forward? What is the, the, the key to church life in these times? For me, it's relationship. It's about building relationship with each other, growing close to God, and then getting closer to each other in that, that sense of fellowship which comes through that. That's our challenge, I think, in these times, to build that relationship. And I'm so glad that as churches, we relate um, in this area. It's a very special thing. And um, in a Christian Unity Week, isn't it good that we are, have that togetherness and these shared activities, and we can work to build each other up in our faith and life. So relationship is good. I enjoy it. Um, it's good to, to, to be with, with others and to share, but we need to, to not just um, say, oh, yeah, that's what we do, but actually make it a target, make it an aim, make it something which shapes our vision as we go forward. Amen. We're going to sing now, O Great God of Highest Heaven. <laughs> together in prayer. God of justice and of grace, please teach us through prayer and reflection to journey inwards so that we're grounded in your loving spirit. And then, in turn, we can journey outwards in wisdom and courage, following your path of love and justice in your world. 
You made us in your own image, becoming one of us in Jesus, delighting in those you have made. May we, for our part, delight in being part of that worldwide humanity, eager to discover and celebrate your image in every person, every culture, every nation. <coughs> Forgive us when we are self-serving and help us to grow in understanding as we extend your love and justice to all. Remove the scales from our eyes so that we can truly see the needs of those around us. Give us courage not only to name injustices, but to challenge them while providing authentic presence, witness, and compassion to those in need. Lord of the power and the glory, you became for us the servant of all. May we in our lives know the power and the glory of servanthood. Enable us to minister to your world according to its needs and to our abilities. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, we sing together. blessing of God the Father, of God the Son, and of God the Holy Spirit be upon you and with you this day and every day. Amen.